Well, this is the RV video that could possibly change your life. Hi, my name is Amber and I'm an ex-Corporate America employee who decided to sell my house, sell all my belongings and start RVing on the road. I travel full-time in my van and I've traveled for over 1,465 days now since first starting this adventure and I've learned quite a few lessons and I've made some mistakes along the way. So in this video, I'm gonna share with you some of these lessons that I've learned and some of these mistakes. So hopefully you don't make the same mistake that I did and you can learn from my experience traveling nomadically for these 1,465 days. So I'm gonna give you an inside look into what this life is actually like. And I'm also gonna share some things with you that have made this RVing experience truly amazing. So stick around for some inspiration, some motivation and some plain old fun. So if you're new to my channel, let me get you up to speed really quickly. In May 2017, I sold my house and all of my belongings. I don't even have a storage unit. I bought an RV and I went out on the road. Now mind you, I've never been RVing before prior to this, but I knew that it was something that I would like because I loved road trips very much. And I tell you what, I had fear built up inside of me when I first started on the road, mostly because I just didn't know and I didn't have the knowledge, but you learn really, really quickly. So my first RV was a class C. I only had that for a year and my second RV was a van and that's currently what I'm in right now and I've been in this one for three years now. I just ended my fourth year of RVing. I cannot believe it. I feel like it's gone by so fast and I've seen so many things along the way. But if you wanna get caught up on that, I just released a video just the other day that shows a big summary of my entire last four years and all the places I've been to and the things that I've learned along the way as well. If you wanna click on that video, it's just right up here. It's been an amazing experience, but I will tell you, once you're out on the road, you might find there's more out there than you think. What I mean by that is a lot of people ask me, when are you gonna settle down, Amber? I don't know. I love what I'm doing and I feel like the more that I'm out there, the more that I add to my list to see. It's a big world out there. Even just here in North America, there is so much to do and so many places to go and see. So first I'm gonna to talk to you about some of the lessons learned and hopefully things that you can learn from as you decide whether you're gonna RV or you're going to buy a van and you wanna get out on the road. The first one is you definitely wanna know the size of your rig when you get out there. There's a really cool GPS called Garmin RV. It's got a nice big wide screen on it. You can plug in your height, your width, your length. So Garmin RV will allow you to navigate around the streets without any issues and it'll navigate you around those like really low bridges so you don't smack one and shear off your AC. You don't want that to happen. By the way, anytime I mention any products or any kind of services or websites or resources, go ahead and look down in the description box of this video and you'll find links to all of that so you can get to those things very quickly and do your own research. The second thing is the in and out method. Now, what is that? Sounds a little weird, but what it means is if I bring something into the RV, then something has to go out. Our RVs have weight limits on it, GVWR, gross vehicle weight rating. If you hit above the max of that, well, you're gonna be overweight and you could bust a tire or have a collision or an accident and you just wanna be safe and keep that weight down. I try to keep the weight of my van down pretty significantly so I don't tax my engine and my transmission and my tires. So in out method, something comes in, something has to go out and typically kind of like weight. Now, sometimes you're gonna have things that are gonna come in that you're not gonna take out, so like groceries, for instance, but just be careful, especially of the bigger items like bikes, weight, equipment, any kind of your extracurricular toys that you're using in the outdoors. So just be really careful about those and watch your weight. You can also go to scales, cat scales, they're usually at truck stops, and weigh your vehicle every once in a while to make sure you're not hitting that GVWR. The third one is 
Make sure you always have two at least fire extinguishers depending on how big your rig is. In my van, I have two fire extinguishers. The reason why is I only had one originally, but my van caught on fire when I was in Alaska. It was underneath my hood and we were able to put the fire out very quickly because I had a fire extinguisher in here. But once you use that fire extinguisher, it's pretty much toast after that. So you're gonna have to have a backup. And if you had a bigger fire than what I had, you're definitely going to need two. The fourth thing is solo boondocking. I get this question a lot is, are you scared? to solo boondock? The answer is, when I first started, absolutely I was scared. Anything that went bump in the night, I freaked out and wanted to hightail it out of that camping spot. Literally the first time I thought I was going to leave all of my equipment in my campsite and take off down the road. But here's the thing. With fear, fear usually is something that's kind of a gut feeling, right? It's telling you, hey, there's something going on, you need to pay attention to this and make some decisions. Fear doesn't mean that it's wrong what you're doing, it just means pay attention. So it could be wrong, it could be something that's bad, but it also could be something used for good. So the only way that you overcome fear is by doing it. And this lifestyle, if you wanna boondock and you wanna boondock solo, you just have to get out there and do it. Baby steps might be that you boondock with somebody else who's done it before and you feel a little safer and you kind of learn the ropes, especially where to go to, where to park, and how to find places. I know that sounds really simple, but it is really that simple. The fifth item is you don't always have to stay at Walmart. A lot of people think that if they're traveling along the highways, they'll just stay at a Walmart. And now while it's easy and convenient, it can be a little bit loud sometimes in a Walmart parking lot. And if you're a person who has a hard time going to sleep, it might be problematic for you. So I'm gonna give you two things to go look at. One is campendium.com. You can also download the app for that one, Campendium. It's Camp Endium, C-A-M-P-E-N-D-I-U-M. I'll put it right here in the bottom so you can see the spelling of it. The other one is iOverlander. They're both apps. You can also go online and look at those as well. Both of those apps have really great resources for you to find camping spots. So they have things on there that are free. They also have some places that are paid for. That's mostly Campendium. iOverlander typically is all free. So go on there and look what other people have put in there and what their reviews are of those sites. The Campendium app will also tell you whether it has a good cell signal for Verizon, for AT&T, T-Mobile, whatever your service is. And that way you can make some decisions on whether you should stay there or not. Some of them are actually close to the highways, some of them are far off. You might use both of those apps to just explore a little and venture out outside of a Walmart. You might get a better night's sleep, you might have some really great nature and a cool place to wake up to in the morning. The sixth one, which might seem like a no-brainer, but that is stock up on groceries in your fridge before you get settled, whether you're at a campsite, a campground, or BLM land or national forest land. You don't wanna get out there and then have to go back into town and go get all of your groceries. Plus there have been times where I've had to literally move sites because that one didn't work out for some reason and I've had to go a little bit further. You'll thank yourself for it. You'll have some groceries for in the morning so you can make a nice big breakfast at your beautiful new campsite wherever you're at and that way you don't have to worry about struggling to go back to a grocery store when you've been traveling all day and setting up your campsite. And if you're in a van like me, or an RV where you don't have a secondary vehicle to go into the grocery store, well then it's even more of a no-brainer to get groceries before you go to your campsite. So the seventh item is to keep up with your maintenance and also if things break, what do you do? So we all have maintenance items on our RVs all RVs are not created equal. They all have differing things that need to be done to them in order to keep up on maintenance. So you'll wanna look at your book for that, whether it's your chassis or your home to figure out what your maintenance is that you need to do on your RV. But the key is to keep up with it because if you don't, you could have severe damage to your RV, like leaks potentially, if you're not making sure that things are sealed properly on an annual basis. If you do have something go wrong and your RV is under warranty, well, you can take it into a dealership and have those items fixed. It sometimes takes a very long time to get those things done under warranty. It's the unfortunate part of owning an RV. See if a mobile tech can come out. They're really amazing typically. You can go online and look at reviews of these mobile repair companies and see how great they are give them a call get some prices see when they can be out how much do they charge to actually come out what's the fee for that and then what's the charge to fix something 
So they're usually really, really good. I've had to hire them twice and I've never had an issue with the two people that I've had and they've actually been able to come out the same day and fix the issue that I had going on. So I highly, highly recommend mobile repair companies. Even if you're under warranty, if it costs you $100 to have something fixed versus going into a dealership and waiting six weeks to have them fix it, what do you think you're gonna do? I mean, you might wanna save the $100, who doesn't? But time is money also, and your travel plans might be messed up because you have to keep the RV there for six weeks. If you haven't thought about mobile repair companies, then take a look at that. That might be a really good option for you to get you back on the road a little bit faster. The eighth item, and this one can be a little controversial sometimes, but my suggestion is when you buy an RV and they try to sell you the extended warranty, my frame of mind is I don't buy it and I'll tell you why. One, it's pretty expensive. And two, as I was just saying before, warranty work takes a long time sometimes to get fixed. Not all the time. And again, it depends on what it is, but it does take a long time and you can be without your RV for a significant amount of time if you do go get it repaired under warranty. Your RV is your house. It's just like having a sticks and bricks house. Everything in it, you can probably fix yourself or hire someone to do. If it's your chassis, your chassis is gonna be already covered under a warranty through the manufacturer, like Dodge, Ford, Ram, Mercedes. So that's a whole different story, but the extended warranty only covers the things in your house. So if your sink faucet burst for some reason and you needed to replace that, do you wanna go through the trouble of making a claim on an extended warranty that was already very costly and then go to the dealership to have them repair it and it just takes too long when you can go spend $20 at Home Depot and fix the faucet yourself. Now, I realize that some people can't do that themselves, but that's where mobile repair techs come in or just getting to know other RVers who know how to do these things and are really handy. You'd be surprised at how many people are willing to help you and help you get things fixed in your rig. And I get that some things can be way more major than just a faucet. It could be a window, it could be your pipes burst or something like that, but I'm just giving you ideas to think about um, so that you can make good decisions for yourself. All right, so the ninth item is to be flexible. I'm a planner by nature. I love to plan. I like to know where I'm going, what I'm doing, where I'm going to be staying, but I realized very quickly when I started planning every little thing out as an RVer that I missed out on opportunities because I would get to a town that I really loved and I wanted to explore more, but yet I had these plans in the future that I really needed to like fast track on the highway and get there. So it didn't allow for me to be spontaneous. Maybe plan in some flexibility in there, that might help you. The other thing is things happen weather happens, you have to move because of weather, you might have a family member that got sick and needs you and so you might have to leave for that. So if you're going to book campgrounds, make sure you understand what their policy is on canceling. Some of them have some pretty hefty fines for canceling uh, too soon close to your reservation. Uh, some of them have zero cancellation policies. Some of them are $10, $15 to cancel. So get one that feels reasonable to you and that you can afford should you need to cancel your reservation if you're in a campground. If it makes you uncomfortable and you're a planner, you'll get used to it. <laughs> It'll happen often enough that you'll get used to it, but uh, there's a lot of us on the road that are planners and hopefully just, again, remaining flexible when situations happen, because they will, then you can adjust accordingly. All right, so next I'm gonna go into my biggest mistakes that I've made, and I hope that you don't make these too. So my first one is getting stuck. I got stuck twice actually. I told you one story earlier about getting stuck in the sand in Yuma, Arizona. The other one was when I was in upstate New York, also in my class C, and I got stuck there. Thankfully, there was a guy next door that actually had a backhoe and he came and pulled me out. I had to figure out, it's happened to me twice, what am I gonna do in order to get myself out? So one, it didn't cost me money, and two, I didn't have to rely on other people to really help me. There's something called Max Tracks that will help you. It's these nubby tracks, but you can shove them under your tires and it gives you traction so that you can get out of a stuck situation. So I bought those after I got stuck the last time in Yuma and I have them in my van. 
Some people put them on the back of their RV. If you have storage, you can put it in storage. I actually store mine under the head of my bed. Just lifts my head up just enough. I like it. I feel like I have a little bit of an adjustable bed. <laughs> and I put those max tracks under there so that I can access them really quickly if I needed to and get unstuck. My other mistake is not having an air compressor highly suggest an air compressor. The one that I use is called Viair. It's specifically made for RVs, so it can air up tires at higher tire pressure ratings. Now, my tires are anywhere between 65 to 80 PSI, but other bigger RV tires can go really, really high past that. So I actually got an air compressor that will handle my tires and other RVers tires. And the reason why is because we're a big community out there and we always help each other. And I wanted to make sure that I had an air compressor that could also not only help myself, I can blow my bike tires up with it, my RV tires with it, any kind of inflatable outdoor or toys and then also other RVers tires should they need it and that's exactly what happened to me when I had a flat tire out in the desert I had some escaper friends around me and I did not have an air compressor and they came through for me let me borrow the air compressor so I could get to a tire shop and get my tire changed out the third mistake is pulling into a campground when you're a 30 amp and it's a 50 amp setup so how do you get around that they make 50 amp dongles same situation too, if you're a 50 amp and you need to go to a 30 amp, they have a dongle for that as well. And I will tell you that there have been times where I've told them I'm 30 amp and they're gonna put me in a 30 amp site and I get there and it's 50 amp. Make sure you have a dongle with you. It's really super simple. Stick it in the back of your van or your RV and make sure you have that with you so that you don't have any issues when you pull up to a campground and you realize you can't plug in because you don't have the proper equipment. Nobody likes that. After a long day of traveling, you wanna be able to plug in and rest easy. So the next mistake that I did is not having a tire pressure monitoring system on this van. I had one on my Class C. I thought the van actually came with one on the chassis and it will tell you if the tire pressure is low, but it doesn't tell you which tire it is. It also doesn't tell you what the temperature of the tire is. I added the tire minder, tire pressure monitoring system to my van. The reason why you want a tire pressure monitoring system is because you do not want to have a blowout on the road. Nobody wants that, of course. If you're pulling a trailer behind you too, it's even harder to know that you had a blowout potentially. So the only way you might know that you even had a blowout is because your tire pressure monitoring system is going to tell you. Obviously you want to prevent that by looking at your monitor and seeing what the tire pressure is and also the temperature of it. But if you do have a blowout, it's going to alert you to that fact and not drag your trailer along the highway and potentially cause a fire or any more damage to your trailer. The other mistake is I left my awning out a couple of times <laughs> and I was driving. One time it was out just a little bit and I caught it by looking in my side mirror and the other time it was completely out. I was in Alaska and I hear all this honking next to me and it was a guy telling me my awning was out. I was like, Ugh, I can't believe I did that. Now imagine if I had turned a corner where that could have hit a light pole, another vehicle, it could have caused some damage. So it's a good idea to go around and check the perimeter of your RV before you leave. I know this, I had been doing it for years and I still didn't do it. I got lazy. So do a double check around your RV to make sure everything is working properly and put in its place where it should be. Along those same lines is locking all of the cabinets in your van or your RV before you leave to go out on the road. I cannot tell you how many times I have left a door unlocked and I'll turn a corner and bam, the whole drawer comes pushing out and it can break actually the door mechanism so that it doesn't go back in properly. Just do your checks before you go. It takes a couple of seconds and you're gone. My next one is what is my biggest regret? So my biggest regret is when I first started out RVing, I didn't actually look at every single type of RV out there. I had seen some YouTube videos on things that I thought I might like, but I didn't really research everything specifically. And the one thing is that if I could do it all over again, I would have gone with a truck camper. Hands down, would have done it. I didn't even look at truck campers when I first started. It wasn't even on my radar. I dismissed it as, oh, it's too small. It's gonna be too much trouble. It's not worth it. I think it just would have been a much better situation for me and I wouldn't have spent so much money on buying the Class E and then the van. So my point to you is look at all the options. Don't dismiss everything because you have a preconceived idea of what it might be. Go to dealerships and 
walk inside of them and really explore every single option before you do it because it's costly. It's like buying a house, but you have all these different options, right? They're all, in all different sizes and variations and slides and no slides and lengths and heights and widths and bathrooms and showers and no showers and the list can go on, guys. There's a lot of options. And my last thing is inspiration and motivation, what I have received from this lifestyle. And the number one thing that I can tell you guys right now is that freedom, the freedom to go and do and explore anything and everything that I want and do it without being tied down to a cubicle. And I've really loved it. It has brought so much happiness to me. I can't imagine anything else in my life right now. I can explore as much as I want or as little as I want. I can change my campsite, the state that I'm in, I can change my backyard, I can change the place that I'm going to go hike that day or that month, or you can go and meet friends, you can meet family members, and all these different places. And it has just given me so much freedom in my life and so much joy that I truly love it, which is why I love to share this lifestyle with you guys and hopes that if that's something that you're looking for, that I can help teach that lifestyle to you as well so that you understand what you need to do in order to move from a sticks and bricks lifestyle into a nomadic lifestyle. And if you're interested in doing that, I have a nomad mentorship boot camp that I created just for people like you because I was in your position as well and I had nobody to talk to about it. I've had to learn everything along the way on my own. I didn't know what to do in the beginning. So if you're interested in this nomadic lifestyle, check out my nomad mentorship boot camp. It takes you from beginning to end to figure out exactly what you need to do in order to move into this type of a lifestyle so you'll have an action plan ready to go when you're ready to make that leap. You have lifetime access to it. I have live video calls every single month so that we can all connect and learn from each other. You can get all of your questions answered. And then I've also built a community that's on the back end so that all of you can communicate together and with me and we can share, inspire, motivate, learn and grow with each other. So if you're interested in that, click on the link below so you can get signed up. All right, guys, I will see you in tomorrow's video. If you're new to my channel, I do daily videos. So I will see you tomorrow. All right, guys, have a good evening. Bye.